Welcome back, AP. Yeah! Guest drop in the vid. All right, so, <laughs> all right, appreciate it, bro. Um, so, anyway, let's get into this. I got to keep it under 10 minutes. So I gotta, blah, 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 blah. All right, now, but really quick, let's get after it, all right? So we left off right here over the weekend talking about the lives, the changing lives of people during the 1700s, right? So I need to really quick get a, get a stopwatch out so I can make sure I stay under a certain time limit. All right, so but the big thing is, right, uh, leading off right here, by the late 1700s, the market begins to, be, begins to become saturated in basically all levels, right, with new world items, plantation products, and things that are being manufactured outside of the cities, so things are becoming much, good job, Danny, cheaper, right? So if everything's becoming cheaper, that means that the poor get a chance to imitate the wealthy, right? So let's get after it really quick and talk about something that's phenomenally important and the only thing that you really need to write down and the rest of it, all you gotta do is listen to. Speaking of imitation, the consumer revolution. People can finally buy stuff. Oh my God. Tomina is so excited. All right, so now, the consumer revolution was a wide ranging growth in consumption and new attitudes towards consumer goods that emerged in cities of Northwestern Europe, particularly in the areas of Paris, Marseille, uh, parts of Spain, um, and they're super Catholic still, uh, England for sure, the low countries, i.e. the Dutch, right? Like they're doing it big time because of the Eastern companies and stuff. So that it's huge though in the second half of the 1700s so from like the 1750s and on this consumer revolution begins right so and it's like so very very important to understand the premise of how all this stuff works right because people can now finally afford stuff right and where is it going to start of course in the elite right it begins in the elite because as the elite begin to notice the fact that the poor now have more money, right? And they have more money to buy certain goods. Then people are going to kind of rise up and they're going to try and keep... I totally made animations for all these things, but this is some hot garbage. All right, whatever. But right here, her name was Rose Betty. Something Rose Betty. All right, but she's a French. She was known as like the minister of fashion, right? So she was kind of the trendsetter. One of the wealthy trendsetters that tried to separate the wealthy style from the poorer style. And every time the poor would actually kept up, catch up to the wealthy style with cheap knockoffs... They, she would change it, right? And so very, very big, big things about the consumer revolution were, of course, clothing, fabulous hairdos, different styles that would keep emerging over and over again, patterns, textiles, all kinds of stuff. And this was also very well seen, even the roles. That right there is your favorite, Laura Marie Antoinette, right? Marie Antoinette sporting her big old hairdo from the late 70s and huge, luxurious fabrics, multi-layered, multi and that is also the style of a role. Now, really, really quickly, this was most seen in women, all right? Most seen in the female communities of Europe, right? But that doesn't mean that the men were completely excluded, right? Men's fashion changed dramatically as well. I wear that coat, or a shorter version of it. Now, anyway, so the men, the royal men used to try and stand apart. Walking sticks, long coats, hats, uh, powdered wigs began to come, be coming back, ponytails, short ones anyway, like your founding father's ponytails began to like be a big, big popular thing because these products were now much more available, right? It wasn't just small base artisans producing these things anymore. It was whole seamstress factories producing them, right? Not industrial revolution factory level yet, but industrious revolution factory for sure, right? You were hiring seamstresses. You were getting custom-made clothes. Now, if you got custom-made clothes, though, like I said, that means that things are now available, like cheap knockoffs, right? So this right here, of course, is a woman painting. She is a noble woman. She is an aristocrat. She is a higher end. She is wearing fabulous clothing, whereas if you look right here, notice the similarity in style of one of her maids, right? One of her servants is still wearing maybe last season's, like, kind of uh, last season's flair with like a veil, maybe some like shawl, some sheer, right? But look at the sleeves, right? Very, very similar in terms of style, very similar, but dulled fabrics a little bit for the poorer community. Cheap knockoffs became a big thing, which is going to stir the pot with this consumer revolution. Things like dishwares are going to pop up as well. Back in the day, you all used to eat out of the same like pot. Now you can afford your own spoon, right? Possibly even your own bowl. Cheaper books, printed books became a thing. They're going to lead to that big lending surge. Stoves, people began to actually start cooking on enclosed stoves. Charcoal stoves was a big part of the re consumer revolution. Oh, this is a great one too. So the way homes were set up was drastically changed as well. You, people began to afford shades that would divide rooms to give more purpose to different rooms, right? So you could buy different things for these now new different rooms, right? So the 
the elegant look, right? Now, now we got to get into religion, which is, yep, still a thing, all right? So the big thing that we got to get into with religion is most of Europe still very pious, right? Most of you are still very pious, still very, very devout Christian believers. Power, however, though, has shifted from the church to the monarchs now, right? The monarchs of Europe are now controlling much, much, much more when it comes to the power, right? They believe they were in charge of people's, like, kind of social, what's the word I'm looking for here? Social, like, uh, absolution, right? Like, so monasteries are going to begin to shrink, Money is going to be stripped from them and used for things like welfare. Uh, orders that, like, the only orders or monasteries that were allowed to stay alive are ones that nursed people back to health or taught, right? Joseph II is a very popular one. The enlightened absolutist that followed Maria Theresa in Austria. Yeah, you should go back and look at that real quick. Um, so Maria Theresa's son, Joseph II, actually disbanded a huge amount of orders and then took and stripped a lot of that land and then funneled it into different community welfare projects, right? So, oh, Louis XV. The father of Louis XVI, which is the guy... Ooh, details. Can't give them away yet. All right, so now Louis XV is actually going to kick the Jesuits out, right? He's like, you're not helping anybody anymore. Get out of here, right? So, but we got to talk really quickly about how the common people are very, very important, right? The common people is going to experience a Protestant revival and a Catholic revival as well, right? And it's called pietism, right? Pietism, which is a huge movement that began to integrate religion into a warm, more emotional faith involved in your everyday affairs, right? Because a lot of people during the classes, like during these like revivals and stuff, began to think that, oh, our churches have become stagnant and they have become morose, paralyzed in forms of dead conformity is what one person who actually started the Methodist church, John Wesley, said about the Lutheran faith, actually under the Protestant umbrella, right? So that began to bring rise to new evangelicals, right? We've heard this word used in our political sphere a bajillion times, right? Evangelical means kind of like a new Christian denomination or an aggressive mover, right? The Methodists were the big ones that popped up in uh, England, actually to rival the Anglicans a little bit. Called such because they were very methodical in their faith. For this, And I'll go back to it later on. If you see the rabbits giving, giving birth to the woman, it's very, very funny. Catholics, though, um, still very pious. 95, your biggest mass of the year was always at Easter, but the biggest Catholic pietism was like, how do we get all these people back in here, right? Like, we got to get the, like, mass has got to be bigger all the time. So as mass numbers began to wane, things like Jansenism began to pop up under this guy named Cornelius Jansen. So the evangelical movement even, like, branched out into the Catholic faith, right? Off, like, saying it was like, it was basically like the offspring of Catholic and Reformation Protestants. It was, like, really heavy on the original sin ideas and the ideas of recanting, all right? I've got... Dose minutes left. Here we go. So, medicine. Faith healing also still remain very, very popular. Uh, the growth of physicians are going to grow heavily, right? Physicians are going to pop up, and they're also going to be still, unfortunately, believing in things like purging and bloodletting. But the good thing about the 1700s is they began to experiment with different solves and saps and, like, medical, uh, like, different combinations. Al not alchemy, but... um. Apothecary, being an apothecary became a big thing. Pharmacies began to grow as well, mixing different things to create a potion that might actually ail, like ease your ailments, right? Surgery is going to grow from the battlefield as well in Vesalius. Surgeons are going to start doing a lot of big-time amputations. They're going to realize that if I cut a limb to create a small, flat stub, then I can prevent infection and keep the person alive. And a lot of that was seen in wars and grew from Vesalius' anatomy to understand also I must scald it. But unfortunately, <laughs> no anesthesia. Midwifery is going to begin to grow due to all this infant death as well. One of the biggest things about a midwife, so you know, is a woman who's in charge of delivering a child, right? So, but the biggest thing that made midwifery legitimate, I got a minute left, uh, was the Manual on the Art of Childbirth by Madame du Coudray, right, in 1750s, because doctors are going to invent these things called forceps, and they're going to try and corner the market on being a child deliverer as well. But Madame Coudroy in her manual began to actually expose like dummies and birthing chairs and new ideas to try and actually put the midwifery on the uh, like on the legitimate. And then you have the death of smallpox, right? By the cowpox doctor Edward Jenner. 60 million people contracted smallpox at one point or another in European history. That's 80% of your total European population is going to contract it at some point in their life, right? But then he realized, oh, the milkmaids never get cowpox, so let's create this vaccination. There was another form of inoculation that they actually tried to take a bit of smallpox and give it to children so they would grow an immunity to it. But that wasn't very widespread and was only really used by the Muslim communities. But this is a political cartoon making fun of cowpox. Pause if you want to look at it, but it's really, really funny because they're saying, oh, you're going to turn into a cow if you give somebody cowpox. But by the 1800s, cowpox is conquered. Very good stuff. Good to see you. I'll see you guys later.